We now begin a series of screencasts on graphs. And I decided that during this series we will take a voyage. Here we can see Oahu receding in the distance and we're going to work our way up through the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. I had the privilege of being able to go on the maiden voyage of the Ialakai, a research vessel, NOAA research vessel, a five-week trip to the northwestern Hawaiian Islands in 2004. And then the following year, we took teachers up there for two weeks in 2005 up to French Frigate Shoals. So as we work our way up through graphs, we're going to work our way up through the island chain, beginning at Nihoa, and then Moku Manu Manu, French Frigate Shoals, Gardner Pinnacles, Laysan Island, where the ducks are, Lysiansky, Pearl and Hermes Atoll, Midway Atoll, and Curie Atoll. So we've arrived at Nihoa, where we're going to talk about graph definitions, and we ask permission to enter. Graphs are used to analyze many things. They're really great for modeling various kinds of structures in the world, uh, such as maps. Here we have an example created by textbook authors who have the unfortunate luck to live on the East Coast where it's snowy, and they want to be in Honolulu. Uh, we can use it to model circuit diagrams. They're also used to model biological networks. Graphs can also be used to model uh, things like the internet. This is a visualization of the router structure of the internet running in a layout program called Gephi. Graphs can also be used to model social relationships between people. This, for example, is a network of co-authorship relations among people who study graphs. For example, here's Newman the author of one, the textbook that we're drawing some chapters out of. I use graphs in my own research. For example, this is a community structure analysis of an online network of educators interacting through chats and discussions. And this is from an analysis of chat activity in that community where I connect nodes when I find relationships between the chats and then I discover clusters of people who are interacting in different rooms. So graphs have many applications, and we'll see many more during the next several weeks. We represent graphs using the notation g equals v e, where v is the vertices, and e is the edges. And e is a subset of the cross product of the vertices. Now graphs can be undirected or directed, Essentially, an undirected graph, an edge E, is a set of vertices, like U and V. Sometimes when it's clear that we're talking about an undirected graph or when it doesn't matter, we might use the notation parentheses just because they're easier to write. But when we want to be precise, we will reserve that notation for directed graphs because that's an ordered pair. The ordered pair U, V, corresponds to an arrow or an arc, call that an arc, going from u to v, whereas this undirected notation up here corresponds to an undirected edge going between u and v, call that an edge. I'll say arc when I mean a directed one. And uh, that's not the same, of course, as v u, because that's, that's when the uh, arrow goes in the other direction. Usually we deal with simple graphs where you don't have self-loops. This especially makes sense in undirected graphs because it would be rather strange to have, say, um, this. Since that's a, that's a set, you can't have the two th same things listed twice. That doesn't make sense. So undirected graphs especially, we don't have self-loops. Sometimes in directed graphs we do. A self-loop, of course, is an edge that goes from a vertex back to itself. There's something called the handshaking lemma, which is real important in, in uh, doing analysis. And that's simply that if you sum across all vertices in V, the, the degree of V, you get two times the number of edges. And that's, of course, because every edge contributes one count of a degree to a vertex. And just to be clear here, the degree of V is the number of edges incident on it. 
we say that these edges are incident on V. Of course, in the directed version, we may have um, in incident and out incident. This has two edges that are in incident, and it has an in degree of two. This has three edges that are out incident, and it has an out degree of three. Now let's look at paths. A path of length k is a sequence of vertices, like so, such that each vi minus 1 vi is in the set of edges. And of course, this would be a set rather than a uh, tuple if we're in an undirected graph. And we say the path contains the edges and the vertices involved here. A simple path is a path in which all the vertices are distinct. If a path exists from one vertex to another, like from v0 to vk, we say that vk is reachable from v0. And now we have the concept of a cycle. It starts with the idea, of course, that v0 is equal to vk, but we have other conditions. In an undirected graph, we need to have k greater than or equal to 3, because remember, v0 is equal to vk. We have to rule out, in an undirected graph, we don't allow self-loops. And also, we don't allow multi-edges. These are called multi-edges, when you've got more than one edge between vertices. Actually, in some of my research, I have to construct graphs that have considerable number of multi-edges, and then I have to collapse them before I can use other software that won't handle them. So by setting k being at least 3, of course, we are requiring that there be three vertices. So in an undirected graph, that's the smallest cycle you can have. But in a directed graph, we just have to say at least one edge. And this is because in a directed graph, you can have self-loops. A simple cycle is when the v, v sub i are distinct. Uh, sorry, I should say more specifically, v1 to vk are distinct, because of course, v0 is equal to vk. And a couple more important terms here. I'll put them in a different color. Uh, an acyclic graph, of course, has no cycles. And a directed acyclic graph is often called a DAG for directed acyclic graph. Now let's look at subgraphs and connectivity. Well, we'll just define subgraph. This is when, let's say, G prime is a subgraph of G when v prime is a subgraph of v and uh, e prime is a subgraph of or subset of e so it just means that g prime's vertices and edges are subsets of g's vertices and edges a graph is connected in the undirected case if every vertex is reachable from all other vertices and the graph is strongly connected in the directed case, if this reachability is obtained when you respect the direction of the links. So when you respect the direction of the arc. And we sometimes use the term weakly connected in the case of a directed graph, essentially when we're treating it as an undirected graph. So the underlying undirected graph is connected. Now we have a concept of components. These are the subgraphs in, that are connected or strongly connected. And this can also have um, strongly and weakly weak versions. So you, you can say that there's strongly connected components in a directed graph or weakly connected components. One thing to note, uh, back from our discussion of trees, that if a graph is connected, then we know that the number of edges has to be at least the number of vertices minus 1. Let's wrap up with a few more terms. A graph is bipartite. If you can partition the set of vertices into two sets, V1 and V2. So here's the vertices in that set and the vertices in that set. Such that it turns out that every edge goes only between them. No edges connect within one of these sets. So it's got two parts. A complete graph is one where every vertex is connected to every other ones. So we have actually the concept of k-complete, 
So like here's a uh, two complete graph, here's a three complete graph, a four complete graph, and so on. Graph is weighted. If we have a weight function that maps uh, edges, you know, edges in uh, the edge set to a real number. Or you can just think of it as we're putting numbers on the edges, you know, like so. And this weighting is very important in modeling different kinds of things like distance, cost, capacity. Finally, um, when we do analysis of graphs, often we're going to do analysis in terms of this, not in terms of just n, because there's actually two n's here. We're going to do it in terms of the size of the vertices and the size of the edges. So our big O analysis is going to, or theta or whatever, is often going to have two, two parameters to it. You know, we might say that it's some, something is, well, we'll, you, we'll drop out the bars too, just to simplify the notation. You know, order of V plus E, which really means uh, it grows as the vertices grow, plus linear, the edges grow linearly, or you might have something that's theta of V squared E uh, with the corresponding growth rate. And by the way, noting that in a complete graph, size of the edge set, edge set is order of v squared. Not necessarily exactly because you don't have self loops in undirected graphs, but this will often affect how we do our analysis. We might be able to substitute, if we know it's a very dense graph, we might be able to replace e with v squared and then simplify the, the analysis. Or here, I got order of v squared e, and if it's a dense graph, that just means order of e. If it's a sparse graph, but it's connected, you know, you have the potential because e can be closer to the size of v. It's got to be at least size of v minus 1 to be connected. But sometimes when we know it's a sparse graph, we might say that uh, the size of the edge set is order of, of uh, v. So these are two extremes here between uh, sparse and dense. So we'll rely on these uh, facts in our analysis as well. So that concludes our introduction to graph definitions and launches us into the study of graphs.